Back in 1946, a North Carolina fisherman walked into Tom Simmons' furniture shop and asked him to build a fishing boat. He wanted a deep V forward like a New England dory and the aft section long with lots of room for nets that can be hauled up over a high transom. The motor was moved forward into a well so the gear coming up over the transom would not snag on the propeller. She was a workboat built of marine plywood and bronze screws and she handled the rough inlets and surf conditions along the coast so well that Simmons was soon building lots of boats for both commercial and sport fishermen. Fifty years later, Many of Simmons' boats are still in use, despite the fact that the last one was made in 1972 when Simmons closed his shop. Their excellent sea handling abilities make them very much sought after by sport fishermen, even though the long outdated design with sport seats and minimal stowage make the boats a little stumbly and cluttered to move around in. Simmons' sea skiffs, as the boats are known, range in length from 14 to 25 feet, with the 20 footer being the most popular. Today they are found from the Carolinas northward to Cape Cod where these pictures were taken. Planning to build a Simmons replica, I checked the Coast Guard requirements. A lot has changed over the decades. Safety and flotation requirements, shop inspections, hull numbers, manufacturer registration. Plus, I wanted to build with wood, solid wood, not plywood. My sea skiff would have the Simmons hull shape, but the boat was completely re-engineered. With my wife safely off visiting her mother, I lofted the lines from a table of offsets from the Cape Fear Museum. I drafted up a set of shop drawings, then trotted down to the local sawmill to buy northern white ash, the same wood that's used to make baseball bats and shovel handles. Back at the shop, I cut out and assembled the frames for the boat and arranged them on a beam known as a strong back. Note the notches for longitudinal members at the chine and shear and the semicircular limbers, drainage holes, along each side of the center line. Between the limbers is the first element that runs the full length of the boat, the keelson. It's a quarter inch thick and three inches wide and bonded to each frame with a dab of polyurethane construction adhesive. The keelson extends all the way forward and up the stem. A boat builder cannot have too many clamps. With the keelson in place, the massive stem form is removed and replaced with lighter stem backers and the two forward frames. Two additional strips are then laminated over the keelson. The tension then turns aft. The transom and motor well are built of three quarter inch thick ash planking, which is doubled on the inner transom where the motor will be mounted. The entire assembly is then mounted in line with the other frames and bonded to the keelson. To prepare for installing the chine logs, the keelson is notched for a flush fit. The right notch is for the chine log, and the left notch is where the first plank will attach to the stem. Much more wood will have to be fared off before planking. The chine and shear logs have been laminated in place. The stem is yet to be fared. The herringbone planking on the bottom has been installed and trimmed flush with the chine log. The side planking has been started at the shear and worked towards the chine. The planks are all edge glued to each other and bonded to the frames. It's all done with clamps and no metal fasteners. From the front you can see how the planking has overlapped the fared stem. These tails will be trimmed flush before the final lamination. Clamping gets complicated with the final stem lamination as it becomes more difficult to find something to pull against. For the second layer of bottom planking, clamping is impossible. Screws are used to hold planks in place while the adhesive sets. Weeks later, the screws are removed and the holes are filled with ash plugs. A keel strip is glued and screwed. The heavy stainless steel screws remain in place. The hull is ready to be flipped over for some interior work while the bottom planking adhesive is allowed to fully cure. Somehow, right side up, the boat seems smaller. Note that the final stem lamination and bottom have yet to be trimmed flush to the planking. This detail shows the interlocking laminations of the stem backer, keelson, keel, shear logs, and planking. The interior components, foredeck, gunnel planks, and sole have all been fabricated. A hard drive crash ate the construction pictures. Note holes drilled through the frames just below the gunnel planks. These will accommodate the conduits between the console and the motor for various functions. Steering, motor controls, hydraulics, light, power, etc. Everything comes out and the hull gets flipped over and sanded and the finishing work begins. This is the first coat of stain. After the stain, the bottom is draped with 10 ounce fiberglass and bonded with clear epoxy. Then the sides are draped with 6 ounce glass and epoxied. 
The fiberglass ensures that a uniform thickness of epoxy coats the hull to protect the wood from scratches and abrasions. Once saturated with epoxy, the fiberglass magically disappears. While the epoxy is still a little flexible and tacky, the excess fiberglass is trimmed away with a razor blade. When the epoxy looks flawless, the entire surface is sanded dull and given two coats of exterior polyurethane. With the exterior finishing done, the hull is hoisted up and rolled over again. It's all hands on deck for this event. Right side up again, the utility conduits, console, fuel pedestal, and sole are all installed. Ceiling is laid up across the frames in the aft two-thirds of the boat and the cavities are filled with flotation foam before the gunnel planks are installed. In the bow, where the ceiling is omitted, spacers are fitted between the frames to support the ends of the sole planks. The sole, beside the layers of stain, epoxy, and polyurethane, is also coated with a dusting of 100 grit garnet sand to provide traction under the wettest conditions. Seated on her trusty shop trolley, the boat gets rolled out for waxing. That was followed by installation of the electrical system, the hydraulic trim tabs, and docking and anchoring hardware. There's stowage space beneath the foredeck for the anchor chain and road, as well as the fenders and a life jacket or two. There's also stowage space inside the helm console. I'm not keen on running out of gas, so the boat is outfitted with two six-gallon fuel tanks. When the first one runs dry, switch the hose to the other tank and start for home. The tanks are secured in a locker beneath the helmsman's seat. Running at top speed in a chop, most skippers prefer to stand at the helm, but for a long stretch of trolling, it's heaven to be able to sit back in a well-padded chair with your feet at a comfortable height, no matter if you're five foot two or six foot three. When it's time to run back, just loosen the two wing nuts and the footrest stows beneath the seat. The electrical system starts with two AGM batteries, a battery switch, and over a dozen individual circuits. There's an LED light inside the helm console so you can see what you're doing in there. And if you want to install new equipment at the helm, the top lifts off for easy access to all wiring and cables. Straight from the factory, most boats are ready for going, but few are prepared to stay in one place. I wanted an anchoring system that never necessitates bringing a clumsy, mud-dripping slime hook into my boat. The anchor is secured into the bow roller with a tensioner on the chain, backed up by a lanyard in case something slips. The road can be secured at an amidship cleat, so the anchor can be deployed directly from the helm station. The helm station is equipped with a compass, steering, engine and trim tab controls, lighting controls, a bilge pump switch, a voltmeter, and a horn. The motor is a 40 horsepower four-stroke outboard by Mercury that runs on regular unleaded gas. The tilt is hydraulically assisted. Stainless steel hydraulic trim tabs allow the boat to be properly trimmed regardless of how loads are distributed and the boat cups up onto plane very nicely. A hydraulic pump is located inside the helm console where it is protected against spray and mechanical damage. Also stowed beneath the console is a flare gun kit, reserve hydraulic fluid, spare light bulbs, extra tie-down clips, and bungee cords. The trailer is a hot dip galvanized unit by Yacht Club with a jack, class 2 hitch, lights, and a loaded tongue weight of about 75 pounds. Fully loaded gross weight is about 1,800 pounds. The boat will float off the beds just as the tops of the fenders go underwater. Don't mind the guy in the red shirt. After four years, he's about to find out if his baby floats. Aye, she does float. And she hustles right along. Okay, bring her back to the trailer. Now we have a chance to make someone really happy. This could be you. To make an offer for Solitary, contact Anderson Boatworks at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.